What were your first impressions of Keen when you started working together? <laughs> Do you know the the noise supposedly on these cans and every other can doesn't actually have to be there, and it's a marketing ploy so that you always get that same feeling. Get that like the dopamine hit. It's like that tsh, doesn't actually have to be there. There you go. The more you know, not more just the know. coach. There you go. There you go. I have loads of fun facts. Right, guys. What is up? Welcome back to another YouTube video. I am ten days out. Ross is. <laughs> oh, thousand days out. Thousand days out. <laughs> two, <laughs> two, two days back. Thousand days plus. <laughs> How was your training one actually? It's going well, man. Um, I've actually gone to a full body split, um, which is something I haven't done really ever. When I first started training, I think I've done a little bit of it because you know JP said so. You know. Yeah. Um, but I have very limited time to train. I don't have limited time to train. I just don't want to give too much of my time to train in the sense that if I do it during the day, I'm with all you. I coach a fair few is. So it's, it's kind of difficult for me to actually focus and I'm kind of trying to keep everyone on the shit and then but I'm in work, I'm in work so I struggle to take myself out of that and I'll struggle to go and have a meal and mind can open, get training in, go through the normal routine so first thing in the morning works well, there's nobody around, nobody knows who I am so I'm just going to go in there and get, get, get it done and get out. Sweet, sweet. Right, so this is a QA. and a Ross is obviously my coach um, and I've probably said this on the channel a million times but if you want to give it a little bit of an introduction as well, who's Ross Byrne, yeah, sure, pro coach, what yeah. you work for, tick, tick, Yeah, tick. sure man, let's do it. Um, so I'd say the majority of people watching this probably know of me, um, in the most humble and less dickhead way that I can say that. Um, I've been in the Irish scene for, Jesus, um, like 10 years, 10, 11 years in one capacity or another. Um, got into the bodybuilding space probably, I don't even think that was a fixed time, but I was slowly kind of veering into it when, uh, I stopped doing martial arts. I think I became a little bit more aware of like the aesthetic benefits of training and that kind of eventually went from one thing to another. I'd done some mentorships with people like Larry Doyle who people might know. Um, Damien Maher is probably a little bit more niche but a few people might know of. I became very, very, very interested in anything educational. I think down to the fact that, you know, the Irish fitness industry, if you want to kind of call it, that was maybe a little bit behind um, and probably still is a little bit behind and then even those who weren't behind were probably just a little bit ignorant to change. Um, I think because I was young, I was kind of shunned out in that respect because yeah. I was definitely very, very young compared to the other coaches who were doing it. Um, like I obviously started getting into coaching in my mid-teens, so as you can imagine, like even though when I was three, four, five years in it, I was still only in my early 20s. Um, so, you know, I think from that point onwards, I think I just kind of started to veer away from that. Eventually, that led me to look to the UK where, you know, I think the best coaches in the world at the moment are, for perfectly honest with you. I started doing a little bit of mentoring with the one and only Callum Racetrick, which I'm sure everyone watching this has heard of to some capacity. And then eventually he actually offered me a job working for him based off what he had seen me do during the mentorship. And that was originally with the Muscle Mentors. Eventually that led me to work alongside Callum and the Muscle Mentors and Neil Kaufman at the time. And then again, as time went on, I became far more interested in bodybuilding. I went from a kind of, uh, I guess you would call it like a balanced educational interest like between mechanics and physiology to being very, very intently focused on physiology, which eventually led me to drug physiology and just general kind of the, the happenings of the body within the kind of competitive physique. And from there, I started coaching at a pretty pretty decent level relatively quickly. Um, and here we are. I've been coaching Keen since the pro, since the muscle mentors days. Just before Keen actually inquired when I was Ross Brown coaching. Um, but by the time he started, I was with Muscle Mentors. I was in that transition period. Yeah. Technically, you're my longest standing current client. There you go. There you go. My brother. Loyalty, huh? Loyalty, yeah. Um, and that was January 2021. No way. It's that long ago. Well, yeah. It wouldn't have to be that long ago. Yeah, though, January yeah. 21. You're, yeah. you're, still, you're still a tip of time, weren't you? Yeah. I was Tiff Goldwyn and everything. Yeah, yeah, I was, I was actually in Dubai when we started. Yeah, I remember that as well. Yeah, I do remember meant that. It, meant it. Were you with, um, um, what's your man's name? Did I end up coaching him then? Jamie. Jamie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, shout out to Jamie. Right, this is actually a good question to get us started anyway because we were just chatting about how we, we, uh, we started working together. Yeah. What were your first impressions of Keen when you started working <laughs> together? I think if the Keen that started working with me was on my, this is no word of a lie now, you won't take any offence to it. If you inquired with me now, I'd say no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I think at, at the time, I think I was, I was trying to work with more and more competitive bodybuilders. So the idea of somebody coming on for a photo shoot, interested in going and doing that bodybuilding group yeah, eventually, yeah. is always something that appeals to me. And I'm pretty sure from the moment they said it, it was like, this is a long-term thing. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it was, 
I was taken aback by the, the ethic you had with your business. I was very, very surprised by that. I actually remember fondly speaking to Grace going about this guy hasn't switched on. I remember it well. I was this before we became very, very close, you know, like I consider a keener brother at this age. So it's one of those things where even prior to that I was very interested in, you know, anyone who's A from home, B who's young and C has a high level of work ethic. I'm always interested in looking at because I think so many people get wrapped up in this like idea that it, I don't want to say it's easy, like, but the people who are aware of the fact that success is effort away, mm -hmm. I really, I've always like, that's somebody who switched on, you know, you don't have to be as far along as I am or as far along as somebody else is, but being aware of the effort that's necessary to get forward was something that was immediately present when I spoke to you, yeah, and yeah. I think that's definitely one of the things that I would like to take back, and then it was... I need to fix that guy's shoulder blade. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That was Keen had this gammy shoulder blade. That, like, My pausing in general was yeah, fucking yeah, well, so, so, so was everyone's at that stage. But, um, you know. Going on that point, I think one of the reasons why I went to you was that, well, one of them was because you're Irish. Right? Yeah. And, like, yeah, but, man, that's a lot of people's reasons. Yeah. yeah like, like, people that aren't even Irish, like, I just like the way you talk. No, I just, I just like supporting your own. But yeah. secondly was, because I knew I was going to get that kind of education from you and that yeah, kind yeah, of almost mentorship as well. And yeah. I knew at the point where I was at, that's what I needed, you know what I mean? I yeah. wasn't just going to a coach, you know, that I saw on Instagram with the best physique. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it wasn't like, you didn't even have many followers, like 2007 yeah. followers. You the best physique either. I heard the best physique either, <laughs> you know what I mean? But I knew, because I was following you for a while, following you for a long time, and I knew whenever you did say something, it held a lot of value, you yeah. know what I mean? And it had a lot of merit to it, and I was like, right, this guy, he's, going, he's joining the muscle lenders, he didn't even realise at the time. Yeah. But I could see what you were doing in terms of like, learning yourself you know yeah, what I mean sure. and I just spoke to one or two other people who, who were coached by you as well yeah, uh, and I wanted that like very kind of I suppose not in person but almost as close as me in person yeah, yeah. back and forth like the weekly calls and yeah. that's what I always say to any client or any kind of coach coming up is get a coach who's not necessarily doesn't have to be like say Cal who's off the top of the game or whatever yeah, someone yeah. who's a couple of years ahead of you who has the experience that will give you the time that, that you yeah, need sure. to, uh, to progress. Yeah. And don't be afraid to tell a coach you work with that you want to learn from them. Mm -hmm. Do you know, kind of way, like, there's nothing more than I like than somebody who's a couple of years below me who's like, I want to do what you're doing, like, right fucking sweet. You know, there's another person who's going to hopefully have what I would consider decent guidance because, like, I have to consider a decent guidance because I'm the one giving it. So, yeah. like, oh, it's okay or whatever. But it's decent guidance. And, you know, I think if you can find a coach, if the first thing that you notice about the person you want to work with is the way that they look, that's cool. But if that becomes the only thing you notice about the person, and that's going to be something that's going to have to be waved up against what you're trying to get in return. Yeah. You know, there needs to be multiple points of value with anyone who's going to guide you toward a goal. You know, there's obviously the experiential level of it, there's the communicative element of it. You know, some people just don't have those traits in the personality. And if you can't gel with that or you can't maybe even fill that gap that they lack, then that becomes a little bit messy. And obviously, getting on with you is massive. Like, we've gone yeah. from the start, and like, yeah. you were said even after like our first or second calls, like, I don't talk to you the way I talk to some other clients. Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, we could just have a normal conversation yeah. and take the piss out with someone, you know what I mean? Yeah, or, sure. or whatever, without being that like form of fucking you spout knowledge. I, I, I've never, I've shit, never you know ever mean? done that. Um, I guess there's, there's an element of like professional necessity within coaching. Like, there's an element of professionalism that's absolutely necessary. Depends on who you're talking to, depends on what the conversation is, depends on what the context is. But for the vast majority of people, you know, like, a, the vast majority of my clients are older than me. Mm -hmm. You know, they're quite nice. That's the first thing, you know. The second one, the vast majority of them are from the same background as me. So I don't really have that much of a fucking authoritative personality yeah, with these people because yeah. there's no point that there's no point that we talk to these people like I'm above them because I'm not. I simply have something that they require. You yeah. know, it's like there's an answer that you have that they need and that doesn't put me above anyone else. You know, I'll never ever look at clients like that. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why I become such good friends with my clients. Because I don't look at myself as a bulldog. It's like yeah, a team yeah. thing. I think, you know? I think that's, I've taken that into my own culture. Yeah, for sure. It's like, a lesson to do. Yeah, it, it might mean sometimes that, you know, you have to give a little bit more from an emotional perspective to the people that you work with because you've given that buy-in and then they've given you the buy-in in return. But I don't think I can operate the way that I do if I didn't know the people who I coach. That's one question and I feel like this is going to be a fucking podcast, man. Right, this is a bit of a, a, bit of a juicy one. I don't know how I'm going to answer it. <laughs> what is your favourite and least favourite thing about working with you? Oh, fucking hell. That is tough, isn't it? That's tough for a couple of reasons because it's like, how do you even categorise what the favourite thing yeah, is? I think favourite is probably just obviously the friendship that came from it. Yeah, my favourite thing would probably be the relationship. The relationship. For sure. And then another favourite thing is your level of attentiveness and awareness to where you're at 
like where you actually are as an yeah, athlete yeah, is yeah. a very very difficult thing to in in one direction or the other. Sometimes you're trying to take an athlete to be like, okay, stop thinking like you're this sack of fucking milk, you know, yeah. and start looking at what you need to do. And then for some people, it's taking them down and being like, okay, you know, you you're you know sixty kilos soaking wet. Let's calm down. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I think you're always. you've always been very aware of the the long term scalability yeah. of where you're going, and I think that's made the decision making process with you a lot easier. Um, and I think it's made the progression scheme with you a lot easier because it's like you're aware of who you're surrounded by, which are people who have you know four or five years of bodybuilding on top yeah. of you. But you're also aware of the fact that you're just sitting on that kind of cusp of is this my thing, you yeah, know? And yeah. it's still a question you have yet to answer, you know? Obviously, I think you kind of know what you want to do, like, yeah. but there's still a level of kind of learning that's involved and you're, you're very aware of that, you yeah. know? Yeah, I love fairly realistic, and I don't know kind yeah. of where I'm at. No, oh, I think my least favorite thing is probably to do with the friendship as well. I think it can be the fact that, again, just to, like, I'm not perfect, but sometimes that I can sometimes be, I might be lax, or I find it difficult to make harder decisions. If I know, if yeah, I'm sitting there yeah, going, yeah. I'm like, yeah. right, I know this guy's girlfriend, I know this guy's family, I know this guy's dog's yeah, name, I know that met my I've met dad, my brother, yeah, and, then, yeah, and then yeah. I'm sitting here going, do this thing that's going to make you feel horrendous, you know, yeah, that kind of way, yeah. like, or do this thing that's jeopardizing your health. I find that hard sometimes, Yeah. but other than that, I wouldn't say I have a least favorite thing, do you know, that kind of way, like, I don't think I have a least favorite thing about many, many clients. I think I can pick up things that everyone can improve upon, yeah. do you know, and I, I think for yourself, I think just improving upon the fact that there's a level of belief that needs to be relayed to what you're what you've done rather than what you have to do on the day. You know, I think that's a few really just focus on that left foot, right foot, which you have over the last few weeks yeah. significantly better than you have before. So, you know, when that can be managed, you know, that becomes part of the favourite thing. So it's like that person yeah, can take yeah. orders and do what's asked of them, even when it's an emotional order. You know? I'm gonna kind of rob your answer as well and say it. The, the friendship things will obviously probably make it a bit harder to not not I don't, I don't wanna say that I don't see as an authority figure, because obviously I do, you're my coach, I wonder if you can buy it, but yeah. maybe would things be, I don't I, I, you know, you know what I'm trying to get? I know like, what you're trying to get, but the, the problem is, well, but, you'll, but, you'll never know what the alternative is. If you pull that way the cons in that scenario, oh, I'd yeah. rather have that course. friendship. Yeah, for sure. You know what I mean, like, with a coach, than be like, yeah, like this guy shouts and back towards that, I mean, I yeah. don't say it. Yeah, and, like, yeah, and if the most it. difficult thing about that is the fact that sometimes you're like, oh, I don't want to do that, and you say it to my face, and it's not really about that yeah, you have like, the comfortability to go, I don't think I want to do that, or exactly, that's yeah, going to make yeah, me feel yeah. shit, are you sure this is the right thing? You know? and, and that will work out probably for in my favour at the long term, you know what I yeah. mean? Whereas if I held back, I was too afraid to say something to a coach. That yeah, could end up in exactly the shitter and maybe yeah. And it's not even you know it's not even like an unfavorable quality. It's just like a teething issue. You know, it's an yeah. issue that will come up over time as we get better at the prep part of coaching. Do you know that kind of way? Because like, okay, this person's my friend. What do we have to do? What has to change for me to take that shit on? You know that kind of way. I think the in person element of it is massive. I think you speaking to me in person is huge. You know, I think that's a massive thing. That kind of that is a huge benefit that. Like can be weighed up against the cost of the friendship element. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's, like, yeah. it's like all these things, and you're kind of looking at the complete picture of what the coaching relationship is, and then you're saying, "Is that what I want?" What's Ross's honest expectations for your prep, or maybe what were Ross's honest expectations for your prep? For you to be happy with what you present. Full stop. Whatever, whatever comes of that, I don't know. Because like yeah. I, I've said, I've said this in the podcast with that we did with Oscar in the day, pro coach, YouTube, subscribe, shameless plug. Um. Like the, the more that you focus on the one thing that you cannot control, which is the result in the day, the least likely you are to get the result that you want in the day in of itself because you yeah. just riddle yourself with stress. You just riddle yourself with thoughts of who's gonna be there, am I gonna be good enough, am I gonna be this? The reality is that you are going to be good enough because when someone says, are they going to be good enough? Like, good enough for fucking what? You know yeah, what I mean? Like, yeah. Good enough to say that you're an athlete now, good enough to win the Olympia, good enough to win a pro card. Like, what is good enough? You know, yeah, yeah. Are you going to be the best version you've ever been? Absolutely, a thousand percent. Are you going to be happy with what you present? If I do my job right, then yes. Yeah, yeah. And that's about as far as it goes. You know, that there's a level of muscularity that's needed long-term for you for you to be competitive. So I can't turn around and say you're going to win an open class in class. Yeah, I can't yeah. turn around and say you're going to win an overall because I can't say that with enough justification in my head and fill you with false promises. I can't do that. That's not my job. Yeah. My job is to get you in the best shape of your life and for you to leave happy. And that's my job with every single athlete in front of me. Beyond that, it doesn't actually matter. If my athlete leaves stage happy with the way that they look, I've done my job. Yeah, that's well, that's what I say to clients, well, especially my clients on prep at the moment. Like, a lot of them are just losing their shit over stuff they can't control. Like, looking up, say, PCA or two goals and looking like, who's who, competing? Who are they competing against? Oh, he's better than me. 
if she's better than me and like when they're thinking the same thing in their own heads do you, yeah, exactly. you, know you could be damn sure that the same per- the person that you're fucking staring at on the Instagram screen is probably staring fucking back at you yeah, yeah. you know what I mean like they're staring at the screen back at you because they're both just wrecking each other's heads and you don't even know each other and that's completely out of your control like all you can control is how you look on the day and you be the best person of yourself and that's so that's the win in itself, do exactly. you know what I mean? And then if someone turns out it's better than you, shake their hands, they're better than you, exactly. it is what it is. Or if the judges prefer them over you, you can't control that, but you can control you know, yourself and nothing else, and that's just all you yeah. really need to focus. Well, I always find that the, when you're on a prep, if you, can, if you can narrow your scope of what you're looking at at any point in time, as narrow as possible. So what I mean by that is at the start of your prep, you might be looking at, okay, how am I gonna do this part of prep, the cardio, the training, the this, mm-hmm. this, 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 then you get your plan, right? And then as you get to the latter end of a prep, you're simply focusing on less and less time in front Man, of you. Because you're at this stage of prep, I'm, foot, I'm right focusing foot. on the next meal. Like yeah. That's it. Yeah. And then after that, I'll focus on my steps. And then I'll just take it. Just, take it just the box, box, literally. The lowest hanging you, you can box off every hour of a prep yeah. into a separate thing. It's a fucking crazy thing to do, but I used to have to do it when I was prepping. It's like, just box off. Because I was doing retarded stuff. Again, whatever, cancel me for that work. Um, I was doing absolutely nuts stuff every single day. I had to focus on just getting that single thing done because I knew as soon as that was done, some other fucking mental thing yeah. I had to do afterwards. So it's like, you end up just having to box everything off. But that also allowed me to focus on just that task rather than all the shit going on in my head. You know, kind of way. What's your thoughts on the old school versus the new school debate when bodybuilding? I think everyone's just shut the fuck up moaning. Like, everything works, right? Literally everything works. It's the reason my diary was so big. You know, it's the reason why these educated guys are so big. What I don't like is these little fucking poindexers trying to tell everyone how to train. Now listen, yeah. there's a lot of people out there and I do not discredit what they know. My point is the fact is they say it with such a level of authority that they, ha- they have nothing to show for. And they're fucking 60 kilos. Fucking exactly. Right. And like, you have to be able to either use that knowledge on somebody who has proven that it's effective yeah. to their physique if you want people to listen to it. At the same time, Anyone who's known me for any considerable amount of time has known that I spent a ridiculous amount of time and money on education. And I would not take any of it back. Yeah, I would yeah. not. I, I would not. I don't regret a single penny, a single hour. A yeah, single but that's second. how you, you can apply it now. Do you mean like yeah. people have the education with no application? Exactly. You have to be able to apply it. You also need to understand that it only goes so far. There's a lot of things in bodybuilding that sometimes science can't explain. And I'm sure if you deep into the crevices of it and you dig and you dig and you dig and you dig, you'll find a basis of it. For, for some people and for some things and for some aspects of bodybuilding, there are just things you cannot, you just cannot explain properly. A lot of it is mental, you know? But my actual like opinion on it is that I wish people would stop arguing about it. Yeah. If we spent enough time trying to figure out why it works and not how to do it best, everyone would very quickly realize that we're all actually arguing over the same thing. The way that muscles grow is the biggest argument that people have. It's like, this is better for this. This will make this grow better than this. It's like, it's wasted arguments. Why does a muscle grow? What causes it to grow? And where do all of those things happen on both of those training spectrums? When you get there, you're like, ah, hypertrophy is not necessarily a volume thing. It's not a weight thing. It's a, it's a stimulus thing. It's the body recognizing that there's enough stress on itself to have to respond to that stress. So basically it's a, it's a cute evolution, but it's really what your body's doing. It's, it's exposing itself to a stimulus that it's never seen before and then responding to that. And all we're doing with every single training method, methodology, protocol, whatever word you want to use, is just finding an ultimate way of driving that stimulus. Yeah, I, um, I saw this question. I used it for like my, my last YouTube video as like the topic and I was just saying, people think it's black and white when it's not. It's, it's multiple shades of gray. Yeah. And like, if you can kind of marry the two of them together. So like the way I was looking at it is, <coughs> Jesus, oh, please. No, it's a blooper. If, if you can marry them, them both together and find what works for you in terms of like, right, first of all, go in, learn how to train like a fucking lunatic when you're a child. Not a child, but when you start off in the gym. Six years Train of hard, six years of age. So, um, train hard, you know, good intensity, heavy load. Then, right, okay, now I adapt on, I can focus in on maybe being a bit more often with my setup. But the most important thing is intensity. It no means to be there. 100%. Effort, effort over everything yes, else. Yes, effort. And, and the, the issue I have is with these, I suppose, 60 kilo soaking wet lads that are wearing a size medium gas t shirt that looks like a 3XL <laughs> with D handle hanging off the fucking head and yeah, the cuff exactly. and yeah, yeah. telling you to do this and do that. But they're doing a cable row with fucking 5 kilos. Exactly. Do you know what I mean? There's, there's no actual intensity there. Like, yes, their execution is correct and their form is correct, but 
you've no muscle to show for it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what I get annoyed with. Yeah. It does a lot of application in like your cuffs and your bands and like anyone anyway, when the time is right. When the time is right. But it can't make up every aspect of your training. It just yeah. it cannot supersede effort. You know what I mean? Science will never supersede effort, ever. And well, I think science will never supersede effort. It sounds so um, grey and it sounds like an old school thing to say. But like effort is the number one variable. Mm -hmm. And if you can produce enough effort in doing just about anything, your body will respond to it. Maybe. Will Ross compete again? Oh, Jesus. Um, I am almost certain that I don't know. <laughs> Fair enough. Enough. I really, really don't know. Um, so, do I want to compete again? I think I would like to have another crack at it purely because my prep was incredibly aggressive and I just didn't produce a look that I was actually ever going to. That it wasn't the way I should have looked in the day, which is fine because I am, I think a lot, well, okay, all right, you don't like the way I looked either, all right. Um, I think that the look that was produced on the day, like it wasn't actually the amount of muscle that I have, it was really, I just, I, I didn't, I'm not going to go into detail, it's pretty horrendous stuff and I ended up sucking basically my, my body down. So in terms of like a redemption thing, I think I would always like to, but I don't, I don't regret the work that I had to do to get to the shape that I got yeah. to because I was, I was peeled out of my fucking ass, you know, and I did some pretty horrendous things to get there. And I know for a fact that there's probably a very, very, very low likelihood of anyone I ever prep having to do that. So I'll always know how someone's feeling and I'll probably have always felt worse. Yeah. So in that respect, I don't have any regrets whatsoever. But I do have it in my head that I'd like to give it one more crack. Um, the only thing that weighs up against that is the fact that I'm only getting busier. And my number one goal as somebody who's involved in bodybuilding is not to win bodybuilding shows. It's to bring clients to win bodybuilding shows. It's to bring athletes to the Olympia. And it's, I've said this before publicly, it's to be one of the best coaches on the planet. Mm -hmm. That's my goal. And if competing is gonna take me away in any significant sense from the ability to do that and, and achieve that, then I'm not gonna do it. What would be the plans for King's off season? <sighs> make it long and make them strong. You know, take the time that you need. Um, come back competitive. Is what yeah, I'm gonna say. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a good, a good, a good sixteen to eighteen months. You know, Man, I, I, I'd even take longer to be yeah, honest. Exactly. I want, like, I twenty twenty five, if not twenty twenty six, and I'm more so looking at twenty twenty six. So I want next my own stage to win. Yeah, you know what I mean, yeah, that's allowed. You just gotta commit to that now. You know, yeah. you've already only had a year, really, of a legitimate bodybuilding off season. You know, and if you can imagine a trip and another year on top of that, and then another year on top of that. Yeah. You know, you can imagine that that kind of builds upon itself. You know, and it just rolls and rolls and rolls and. You know, prep off season is just momentum. You, know, you just you just have to learn how to gain momentum, and then the more that you can sustain that momentum for a longer period of time, the more you can do with a lesser amount of time. If you can sustain that momentum for a long time, the more you can do with a long time, and thus the more you can do in the first place. So, any kind of period of time for any athlete is about trying to find the point where they can gain that momentum. So, like at least 10, 12 weeks of like recovery. Yeah, I, I, I definitely want to go into yeah. the recovery phase. I don't really want. Yeah, just just personally, I just after my first prep, I just think. And I'm going to be to fucking do it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's not classic. I, I, just, I just don't want to. Nah, it's, it's, it's a, it does a, a rebound, so to speak. It doesn't really weigh up any kind of positive unless you're a bit more experience. What's the main difference you see between the Irish and the UK bodybuilding scene? But it's, not, it's, it's a, little bit, a little bit better, but I think one of the biggest things is ignorance. I think a lot of the older school guys, which are slowly being wavered out, which I don't yeah. want them being wavered out. I, I, and I only call them the old school guys because they're older. Because they're older. Me. They're older. Yeah. Yeah, that's the only reason I call them that. Um, and you know you do get a lot of opinions and I think one of the issues as well that happens at home is you get a um, small pond big fish mentality you Massive, know yeah, everyone yeah, yeah. thinks they're the, the number one x y and z because they're you know on the emerald oil of sure like it's funny even when I go home like I'll get into the gym you know what I mean yeah. I'll get fuck you like this is it's like the fucking pro bodybuilder mm, yeah, yeah exactly. I am so far off you don't understand yeah, but people just don't have the it's not yeah. I suppose and people are like just people, people are deluded like yeah, they're just they're just they're just deluded and what what like I think a lot of it comes from the social media thing like at home obviously there is a level of like I don't know what you call it almost like a fantastical element of bodybuilding for a lot of these guys because they're seeing these people over here as like superheroes yeah yeah it's almost like this movie it's like this new thing it's something they can't connect with so they have this kind of disconnect of how fucking difficult it actually is yeah. to go and be a high level bodybuilder especially in the UK which is you know, between all the European, like you got the Spanish, you got like you got over here, best in European bodybuilding country in, 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 like, there is. Man, uh, the standard. Arguably really the best in the world, I'd say, than in America. Yeah, well, the actual standard of top flight guys here is significantly better yeah. in the states now. Obviously, it's a smaller pool, 
But I do think a lot of people just end up being either led down the garden path by coaches or by their friends or by themselves without ever really knowing how difficult it actually is. Like if you're coming over here, like I don't really know many Irish athletes that I can think of now. You know, now again, there's a couple of them. I mean, like you know, even any like athletic you know, Irish Irish guys. Yeah. You know, so we know all the lads back home. Some excellent bodybuilders back home, but a lot of them like they're nowhere near the level they need to be at to be highly competitive, even at a regional level. Yeah, Do you know, it's like you have to be able to understand. But they're, like, they're, they're pro card hunting. Yeah, they're card hunting, and it's like, why don't you just hunt for progress first? Maybe yeah. hunt hunt under ten pounds of muscle, you know, and then come back and maybe go and look at what you're doing and see is like, is it realistic for me to actually think I can do this? Like, yeah, there's a lot of different things I think people are are missing out on. Like the what's actually needed to be a high level bodybuilder seems to be a bit misconstrued in people and in coaches and in you know just general day to day over here as well. Yeah. Like what's actually necessary. And I think that when people start to cop on just what is necessary and who you're looking to beat, which for the majority of people back home is over here, you're going to get a fucking, you know, yeah. slap in the face. Yeah, I, I think, like, even just in general, though, the last few years, it has improved massively. Mm. Like, like, even just the scene back home, like, it's like obviously Definitely. social media and everything has, has, has a role to play that. And how many of them bodybuilders, I suppose, are, are actually bodybuilders? Yeah. Not all of them, but, like, just even from like, a coaching perspective, say, when I started off back home, like there was me and there was one other guy, yeah. and now there's 15, 20 in my town, you know what I mean, in the space of like three, four years, and obviously that has a knock-on effect to the coaching, bodybuilding, fitness, all that kind yeah, of stuff, sure. so it, it is moving in the right direction, but I think even like say, the access we have to going to shows over here, and you know, the gyms we have, and just, yeah, you could be in the gym, and Oscar could be training, or people could be down for a day trip, and there's pros in, yeah. And, and you see it a lot more where yeah you're more exposed you're to it more for exposed sure. to it so yeah. it's, it's easy to be aware when you're exposed to it every day that like I get that yeah. but I do think that there's just a level of attentiveness needed towards that so if you are an amateur bodybuilder watching this back home just you know take a hard look at your physique and yourself and just if you're sitting there saying you're hunting down these cards and stuff like that not because I don't think you can do it you know or anyone else doesn't think you can do it but it's about when you know I'm not saying if you can do it I'm saying when you think you should do it you know that's the big question for most people how do you prepare your clients for stage as regards fears slash nerves if it's their first time? Oof, uh, depends on who the person is. Like, I might say it with you, I do it with a couple of other athletes. If I have an athlete who I'm coaching long term and I know is going to be on stage, I'm conditioning those feelings far before the actual prep comes up. You know, you might not see yourself, I don't necessarily say it openly, but like when a check in crops up, let's say that they're on a mini court, right? And their weight doesn't drop. Mm. Right. Okay. This is an example for me to be able to address an issue that is most likely going to come up again in the prep, where the weight doesn't drop. And as soon as you give them that information relative to how to handle that problem, it's not that they're not just going to take it on straight away. Yeah. But they're going to have heard that advice before, and whether it's passively or subconsciously or consciously, they're going to take that in. So, I think I do my best to try and address future issues before they happen, as much as I possibly can, and then. When it comes to actually on a prep with every athlete, it doesn't matter for a first time, we're just talking to people like people. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like yeah. understanding that bodybuilding is human nature, but it's robotic behavior. And if you also, if you honestly, actually honestly, if you constantly just talk to the robot part, you know, you're never gonna ever, ever, ever fix the emotional element of it. But if you can learn how to speak to the human part of every athlete, which should be your, your day-to-day ability to just communicate as a human in the first place, you'll find you can get a lot more out of people. You know, sometimes the best decision that you can make isn't the calorie adjustment. It's just telling someone they're doing okay. Yeah. You know, yeah. that kind of way. Like, and that's that. It might seem a little bit hoodoo voodoo, and you know, it might seem a little bit soft at times. But so many people are wrapped up in this like heavy metal, robotic, fucking hardcore ideology around bodybuilding. And for a lot of people, bodybuilding isn't hardcore. Um. But yeah, I agree. That's definitely the way I I coach. And again, I probably learned from you is just the the humanity side of things and just yeah. getting to know your client on a personal level and just chatting yeah. to them like they're, they're a person, not a robot, and just. I suppose understanding their, their emotions and, and relating to them as well. I think for me, for sure. being on prep now as well with my clients, it's helped massively because I'm going through what they're going through. Do you know what yeah. I mean? And, and I can, you know, manage my own ones and manage theirs as well, and kind of you know, can bounce off each other. And like I'm in contact with all my prep clients every day at this stage, yeah. just just chatting back and forth and just having that um, not having that like emotional disconnect. You know, which which I think a lot of coaches do. Are like right, this is the plan. Just follow. Shut up. Yeah. Whereas you know, it's not black and white. And even the way, so we, we, we've handled mine the last few weeks in terms of what we've been doing and the refeeds, like, 
just that propelled me forward and after did you know what I mean? Yeah. It's just it's the whole thing of not being cut and dry. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like you have to just die it all the time. And it's like like yeah. people don't understand just how much of the success of a prep relies on the humans that need to think the right way. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's like if somebody is able to manage a lower calorie deficit and you give them a fucking five guys at the end of the week and they're able to handle it and their weight is continually dropping and it just means that their baseline food throughout the week is lower and they're able to handle that better. Why not? Do people look at weight too much when preparing for stage and should we be more concentrated on visuals? Mm. I read that while the load of vape juice was coming along. <laughs> <laughs> spitting spitting the yeah, yeah, spit it up. Um, yeah, they do. Like at the end of the day, it's a bodybuilding show, not what you yeah. weigh on stage yeah. show, which I think kind of answers that. Weight has, it, weight has its value. So like you're looking at the latter end of a prep or someone's skin down their mind and you're using food as a tool or whatever you're using as a tool to bring back fullness, to drive condition forward, to whatever it is that you're trying to do in that acute period of time. And you can be like, oh, that looks fucking sick. You look really good here. Yeah. What body weight are you? Let's say somebody was dipped out uh, for the sake of it, 82 kilos, which is a random number. And the flat as fuck, you know, lines are fading. You know they're shredded, but they're, they're looking flabby because they're so flat. If I did give you a five, 600 gram carb refeed, and then you go from that 82 up to 83 and a half or 84, and you look absolutely mint, yeah. I'm like, right, sweet. I know that roughly 84 kilos is a good look, but yeah. I also know that roughly from your flattest weight, about two kilos up from that produces the amount of fullness on it. Yeah. I know that 600 grams of carbs is probably gonna give me that, that, two, that two kilograms that I need. Yeah. Pair that with the water you're taking in, the sodium you're taking in, you know. You can reuse weight as a relaying factor against the looks. You know what you're chasing, you know what differentials you're chasing. Yeah, yeah, and that's where weight becomes significantly more valuable. And obviously in the earlier point of a prep, like the weight, the metric of weight, it has to be, going it has to be valuable, it has to be going down. Like if you're fucking 20 kilos off stage, man, it's not going down. Yeah, you're fucked. You're like, fucked like. If you're somebody who starts prep leaner and is maybe starting a, you know, a, a higher energy load toward the area point of a prep, then yeah, that's fine. Like I've got a guy at the moment who's you know, dipped down to like 190 pounds and he's slowly just moving up a pound, moving up a pound, moving up a pound, but that's because the novelty of his prep also has the novelty of his androgen exposure. So he's like, he's slowly growing through the area yeah, at the midpoint yeah. of his prep. So it's like, you need to look at weight relative to the variable players that you have going in at the time. Yeah, yeah. You know, like if someone's like, like for example, let's say somebody texts me, like, oh, my weight's going up. I'm like, okay, that's cool, all right. Um, what did your day look like yesterday? I was like, oh, pretty normal, nothing really changed. Oh, I did actually have to have my first, my last three meals at the same time. Yeah. It's like, oh, you fucking numpty. Like, maybe let's, let's just focus on that part of it first, you know? And it's just being able to be attentive to those things. Before you let the emotional element of your weight latch onto you too much, just think about it for a second. It's just one metric. Yeah, it's just, exactly. It's just one metric. Yeah. yeah. If you've done the shit that you need to do day to day, right? If you adhere to your deficit, if you adhere to your cardio, you've done your training. Nothing else really matters. I'm nervous about hitting the stage at a later time as I feel I look my best pretty much fasted and I bought very easily any advice. Make sure you and your coach have a very, very thorough plan on how to keep it tight. Yeah. You know, that's what it is. Like, show day morning is the most valuable and probably the most dangerous point in the prep because you can fuck it up with one decision. Be a coach, be an athlete, you can just fuck it up. You know, so the most common time where you tend to see uh, AM and PM looks differentiated as largely with females because generally they're on later in the day. Um, so if this is a female who asked this question, then you know, first of all, I wouldn't be worried about it too much. You know, you just need to be able to look at again, what have you done up until that point, and what do you think is needed to sustain that? So let's say you've done a big feed the day before, you know, whatever it's 200, 300, 400 gram of carb, depending on your body weight as a female or a male, whatever. Maybe you're waking up, okay, this is a really, really good look. First thing I would probably do is hydrate and add some sodium in, and then assess in 45 minutes to an hour. You should see an improvement. And then, if you're maintaining hydration across the day, which you should be, you know, there should never really be a reason at any point in time to totally limit water, ever. I've never ever cut water with any athlete, ever, completely, ever. And they all come in peeled. Yeah. So, one of the things you need to look at then is maintaining hydration across the day. Because if you've had a massive surplus of food the day before, even two days before, you're going to hold that fullness. Glycogen resynthesis takes about 36 hours. About that, in terms of the food I eat is synthesized into glycogen in my muscles in about 36 hours. 24 to 36, depending on the person. During the, the latter ends of a prep, it's probably closer to the lower end of that spectrum. So if you're 24, 24 hours after feeding, more or less, you're probably fine. 
and it's just going to be a case of hydrating sodium and fill up that's a safe yeah. bet if you have a coach who's confident in what they're doing you might just run in your first meal that you have every single day what is your first meal have that yeah. two and a half hours later how far away from stage are you are you six seven hours if you're still six hours again do your second meal yeah and feed roughly every two and a half hours to some capacity the closer you get to stage the lower volume the meals get i think like the most important thing with that is it should be tried it in peak yeah. week, you know what I mean? And you, and you know, and not in peak week, but say prior to peak week. Yeah. Try it and, and you know, as I said, if you do a, a refeed, right, this is how it looks, this is how it looks at this time. So when you do a refeed, take your fasted shots, take your shots two hours after your first meal, take post workout shots, whatever, exactly. and just see where the best look is and yeah. just repeat. You that. should know that. And either way, you, like, even if you wake up bang on in the morning, like, if you look at your entire prep, you probably look the best you ever look when you're in the gym. Mm. You know what I mean? So, Try relay that for it. If that's what you're relaying through, most people who get into the AM or the later AM times or even the early PM times are probably at an advantage. Yeah, yeah. It's just people panic. They're like, I look like this now. Fucking have to go on now. It's like, okay, just like you can get that back and better. Yeah. It's just having the confidence and the patience and the the calm, like having that level of breathing room to be able to know like I'm good, you know. What is one area you believe Keen can improve on as a coach or a bodybuilder? Or and a bodybuilder. Give oh. me your fucking most harsh answer. Be patient. Be patient with it. I was impatient. We coach in a body with a both. Both. With both. Be patient with it. Don't look at me and say you need to be doing what I'm doing. Mm. I don't have a car for far too long. You know, far too long. Um, don't look at anyone and say that's where I should be. Because everyone's circumstances are so different. And if you could just focus again on left foot, right foot, I'm gonna block out the noise. Yeah, yeah. You know, block out the noise, accept the noise that really matters. You know, the kind of way, put your kind of social headphones on, if you will. Yeah, you know, yeah. so that you only ever hear the things that you need to hear. In terms of actually improving as an athlete, just more muscle. You know, the kind of way, just more muscle and committing to growing muscle and committing to eating and, you know. Yeah, no problem, me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And just committing to that time, do you know, the kind of way. And, you know, uh, double up those yogurt bowls. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just as an athlete, just committing to being an off season bodybuilder, you know, the kind of way. and allowing your day-to-day -day priorities to be worked around that goal for the vast majority of the time that you're doing it. Obviously, I don't believe in full frontal 100% three six five bodybuilding, nothing else. Not something I believe lasts long-term, and if it does last long-term, it fucks your mental up. But I do think that if you have a goal of being a high-level bodybuilder, you need to behave like one, you know, and you need to you need to carry yourself as one. The same way within coaching, you know? Sweet, sweet. Has prep been harder or easier than anticipated? or exactly what I expected, um, so that's more so for me. Um, honestly, it's been easier. There's been some shit days, like don't get me wrong, which I expected, but as a whole, it's been easier than I thought it was. Now, I'm not done yet, obviously, but we're pretty much out the, the back end of it. Maybe yeah, you're, you're, you're at the hard gates. Yeah, out the hard gates. Like the, the worst period probably was maybe like four, five, four weeks out, I'd say, kind of in there on yeah. that time frame. It's the worst part for um, people. There was a couple of hard days, tough days, you know, food focus was high and energy was low and it's kind of just getting by. But I think what happens is is you reach a new low body weight, you reach a new level of feeling fucking shit and then you just adapt and get used to it. So for example, if you took me six months ago and threw me into my body right now in terms of how I feel, I think I was on death's door. Yeah. Whereas now, I'm grand, I've good with energy, caffeine in me. Yeah, it's just, you it's know, just, just a good you. It just becomes me and like, I know two months for show or however long, maybe even fucking two days for show, however long it takes to get back to normal. I'm like, oh fuck, this is actually who I usually am. Because I know myself, I'm an outgoing person, like I, I'm fucking full of life. And I haven't been like that recently and I do miss that. And I know when I get that back, I'll be like, oh yeah, I was actually quite fucking disconnected and I was, yeah, yeah. but I'm, I'm just kind of used to it. But as a whole, it's actually been easier. I, I honestly thought there was going to be, it was going to be a lot harder. Uh, I thought I was going to be doing fucking two hours cardio, I thought I was going to do this and that, I think I've, I've, I've gotten away. I think with the photo shoot prep being my only measure of, of difficulty for this, like I was still natty at the time and like the level of muscle mass I had was fucking close to none. So now everything's just exciting in terms of, yeah, oh, yeah. these fucking veins in my legs and you yeah. know, the way my back looks here, these striations, like I haven't had that before so that just makes it yeah. easier and more enjoyable. 100%. It's the, I think the hardest part of preps for people isn't actually the process it's the mental it's your ability to comprehend the difficult things like the uh, how many times do you ever go and get you a cardio session and you realize that the most difficult part of that cardio session was thinking about it every time every time and they're doing it but that was fine you know yeah 
Yeah. And yeah. obviously towards the end when you're doing like an hour's cardio and you're trying to find it, you're just like, oh, it's six, ten minutes, it's three, ten minutes away. Oh, it's six, five minutes away. You know, yeah, you start doing yeah, all that. Yeah, you're yeah, back yeah. in school. How is your food focus right now? Um, honestly, at the moment, it's grand, it's manageable. Like, I'm kind of at the stage where I don't care. Like, so... I, yeah, I, I, the feed I, definitely helps. Yeah, the feed helps. You know, the refeed helps. Like, peak weeks around the corner. Like, at this point, I, I'm planning what I'm going to eat post-bread because it's so close that I can wait it out. But if I was doing this four weeks ago, I'd drive myself insane. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. So right now, it, it, it's manageable. Um, plans, post prep, rebound, question mark, trips, away, question mark, get healthy and push. Um, so yeah, definitely get healthy and push. I'd like to kind of, I suppose, last show is 30th of September. I'd like to probably go for like eight weeks into the health phase um, and then do my first December push up. And I'm going to Ibiza for closing parties in October, yeah. So. Tips for anyone very attached to training performance when it's inevitably going to be taking a hit on prep. Remember that it's inevitably going to take a hit on prep. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. just stop trying to chase performance all the way through a prep. It's dumb. <laughs> it's, it's, just, it's dumb. I don't care anyone says it's dumb. Hold your performance for as long as you possibly can, within the realms that you possibly can. But when it starts to dip to a considerable level, you're not going to recoup it back. Yeah. And there's actually not that much value in recouping it back. Like people who are still trying to move through PBs, in those like the latter points of the prep, like if you're still hitting PBs two weeks out from the show, you're probably so leaning wrong. Yeah. You're, you're not leaning enough. I don't care what you say. Like you're not leaning enough. That was the hardest part for me. This prep was. Yeah. And, and then sure. one of the questions as well was the hardest part. Well, it's, it's the it's the it's the logbook here. It was. It, you was, know? it was. I I trim my logbook within the two weeks. But I haven't used logbook in a long time. I still advocate a logbook with every athlete that I use. Yeah. So do I with clients, but, but I have to just throw it away because for me, what I realise this prep is what I love most about bodybuilding is training and progressive training yeah and that's my love competing is the cherry on top getting on stage is the cherry on top fucking the way i look is the cherry on top i'd rather be have my training performance at the fucking all-time high and take even a slight hit on the physique just because yeah. that's where my happiness is it's going in doing shit i haven't done before in the gym having a good session feeling good and seeing that deteriorate was hard but you just have to accept it and just, yeah, just you, don't you, you, just, you, you manage it, you know, and I think if, if performance is something you really, really do value, then use methods that you can possibly find to manage performance as best as you can, reduce sets, you know, bring volume down a little bit more if you need to, but there will be a, a, a crossing point where it's, it's just too far gone. Like, I wish I could say that there is a value and that there's a way to sustain performance all the way through a prep, but I just don't, I just don't personally believe there is. I think if you're genuinely prepping the way that you want to prep, okay, if you're taking like, you know, die breaks and regular and regular deloads and shit like that, okay, maybe you'll sustain it for longer. But there's really not that much value in sustaining it right until the end. Like if you can just drive a level of stimulus that is enough to maintain, that's really all you yeah. need to do. Like you know? what I look at my training right now is go in, maintain and just use it as like a, a chance to burn calories. Yeah, exactly. That's what it is, and just tick the box, yeah. get home. How has both of your approaches to coaching changed in the last year, if at all? Yeah, mine's changed massively. Yeah, me too. Um, I'm less against things that I would have been against a year ago, uh, particularly on the drug side of things. I think the more athletes that I work with, the more athletes that come to me with their own um, history of drug use, of bodybuilding, of experiences, the more open I've become to adapt from their starting point. And then from there, realizing the parts of their starting point that I originally would not have agreed with have proved to be very, very valuable. Um, things like the use of AIs, um, of CIRMs, etc., are something that I would have been a hard line no, only because I was told that they're bad. Yeah. Do you know? And after looking into it a little bit more and speaking to people who I trust again in the kind of realm of education on both sides, I've kind of come to the conclusion that things like that may just be warranted. They may just be needed because the level of control that you have is significantly better than when you're manipulating things that will passively drive a response than when you have the option to use something that will give you the desired response that you want. In the form of AIs, it's estrogen control. You know, I'll, I'll take Mastron up by loads to control estrogen and, you know, rather than use AIs that cause dyslipidemia, right? But what also causes dyslipidemia is high androgen loads. So it's like which version of that dyslipidemia, which is a skew in your lipids for anyone who doesn't know, which is things like your LDL and your HDL, which happens as a byproduct of being on gear anyway. Um, which version of that is less valuable or is more valuable or is less dangerous or is more dangerous? So I've definitely changed my opinion on a lot of things. Um, I'm more willing to let people run their own training, um, which is something I've not been as comfortable with in the past because I love programming. 
I still do. If somebody's physique is ass and they're trying to do their own programming, I will say no. I think just to jump in for a second, yeah. an athlete has to be at a certain level though before you do that. They have to be at a certain level. Like, yeah, a certain level of education as well. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Sometimes really, really, really good bodybuilders aren't the smartest people on earth. And that's absolutely fine because they're focused on being really, really good bodybuilders. The vast majority of people I work with who I allow to run their own training, it's not because they're adamant that they want to, it's because I feel comfortable enough to let them run that part of things. I think my biggest limitation on that previously was like, am I not taking value away from that person? But what I've learned is that people aren't actually paying for my ability to program. They're not paying for my ability to prescribe drugs. They're paying for the way that I operate. And the way that I operate sometimes encompasses people having a little bit of independence with what they do. That that is going to keep someone on the straight and narrow more than my very specific programming. But I still have a level of attentiveness and a degree of autonomy over the program if I wanted to, then that's enough. Yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. And loads and loads of things, man. Like there's there's loads of loads, my coaching. Yeah. There's so much shit that's changed. Like, my coaching changes every single year on the year. You know, the, the way that I document the prep, the way that I track data, and um, the way that I use data, the data I ask people to collect, all that has changed massively, you know. Like even during a prep, I would have been very hard on people giving me every single day piece of data they possibly can. Yeah, even the way my prep was managed is just very like body weight. Yeah, you know what I mean, and okay. but again, if I know something's wrong, I can flag it. Again, yeah, I have that level of trust in the client that they, on they a, know. On a prep, the variables that you are trying to control, the consistencies that you are trying to control, should be controlled. You shouldn't have someone on prep who's going to bed at 2 a.m. one night, 9 p.m. Yeah, next, yeah, yeah. going on the session on the Saturday. Like, that doesn't happen. You almost need like a, a lifestyle client or a low, a lower level client, but you know, not a, an experienced athlete to, to track more and to yeah. like to sort out their routine, to sort out their food. You know, when you get to that level yeah. that you can trust them, that it's just basic shit. Like, you have an athlete who's on prep and you're trying to convince them to go to sleep at the right time, pull them out of the prep. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't accept that for one second. Like, I, and that's something I wouldn't. If someone says. I want to win this overall, I want to win this card, I want to qualify for Olympia, and you won't fucking go to bed on time, I'm not coaching you, yeah. I won't do it. Um, and you shouldn't be prepping in the first place, you know, because if you actually gave a fuck about that goal, you'd be going to bed, you'd be eating your meals on time, you'd be getting up and doing your cardio, you know, all these different things. Like I've got guys who are on night shifts who can't go to bed at the same time every night, who would fucking kill to be able to have the choice, yeah, yeah. Do you know? So it's like, just on a prep, I suppose the whole data aspect of it is, when it is required to track it, I'll track it. You know, like, I think that too much tracking is the most dangerous thing an athlete can do on prep. Um, I've seen it with many, many people, again, you know, paralysis, you know, paralysis by analysis. And a lot of people who do it and finish their prep will agree that it's, it's part of the process, you know. It's like, they become so attentive to the data that the data begins to control them. You know, yeah, and yeah. They, you know anything off perfect blood pressure is fucking, oh, Jesus, I have to get this fixed. And it's like, that's another stress you're dealing with. You know, anything off a perfect HRV score, that's a fucking pressure you have to deal with now. It's like, oh, I can't go and train because my, my fucking phone screen told me, you know, I need more sleep. Yeah. And it's like, too much of that, when the going is already good, can create a rough going. You know, kind of way. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you've got to be able to put those things into perspective. So, you know, you definitely craft your approach based off the person in front of you. But I think that previously, I would have crafted the person in front of me based off the approach. Do you yeah. know that kind of way? I would have tried to mold them into what I wanted them to be in terms of the athlete that I needed them to be rather than meeting the athlete where they're at and being the coach who I need to be for them. You know, and that's suppose, definitely what's changed. Yeah, I think for me, just the more kind of, I suppose, you know, prep clients I get, and whether it's photo shoot or comp, just not being afraid to hold back and being afraid to push them, like pushing clients harder than I have before yeah. and the results are, are, are speaking for themselves when it comes to that. So. Yeah, that's definitely, definitely being like able to, to pull the trigger with clients, but no one went, no one went to pull back as well. No one went to, yeah, you know, no one how to pull the trigger. No one had to pull the trigger, but also no one like, right? Look, if I have say, a say a girl who's just start prep in twelve weeks and she's freaking out about going away for a weekend, like, just let her put her hair down and fucking enjoy it and say, don't track, just go away. If you fucking track macros, I'll give out to you. You know that yeah, kind of way. Yeah, yeah. Give them that freedom. Give them that them that flexibility when they're allowed to have it, but when they need to have it or when they need to be. Firm, like I'd be very fucking strict on you then. Yeah. Of course, not, you know, when they have the, the time to be flexible, allow them to be flexible, allow them to enjoy themselves. Yeah, exactly. um, I think a lot of people then, confuse flexibility with bending it to the brakes. Yeah. You know, kind of way. It's like you're allowed to be flexible, you're allowed to have a life as a bodybuilder. Like you look at every, like the majority, a lot of high level bodybuilders now, even lately, like they're coming out and they're even saying, like, I wish I allowed myself to have more time. Yeah. You know, I wish I allowed myself to do more things because 
like if you can eat your meals, if you can do your cardio, if you can sleep on time, if you can take the things that you need to take when you're supposed to take them. Beyond that, life is yours. Yeah. Your life is yours. You're not a fucking bodybuilder. Bodybuilding should, should complement your life and not you don't have to do it around. Exactly. You, know, like you, you should you should make a, not work on your life because obviously there are sacrifices, especially on prep and stuff, but as a whole, it should be fun. Like you do because you enjoy it, do you know what I mean? It shouldn't yeah. be something that you fucking that you're shackled to, I suppose, yeah. you know what I mean? Or, or, or that weighs you down. Exactly. Go for a walk, man. Yeah, go yeah, for a walk. Yeah. Go, go to, outside go, and get some fresh air. Go to the zoo. Fucking yeah, you know, go yeah. have a coffee. You know what I mean? Go That's something that I try to keep throughout this yeah. especially with Vicky. Just like go look at a few ducks. Going for fucking a fucking walk and go and get a coffee and yeah. go into the cinema. You know, you can prep your meal yeah. and do that. Just duck some of the bread that you can't have. Like, just fucking. Yeah, yeah, just, yeah. Like, just don't don't box yourself in. Like, there's, no, there's no point in doing that. You know, there really, really isn't because like the, the more you close yourself off, the more that like veil you put yourself under becomes a box. And the yeah. longer you're in the box, the more it becomes a cage. You know, and it's like, there's not actually anything fundamentally wrong with allowing yourself to live aspects of your life as a bodybuilder. And the fact that things like that and saying things like that triggers athletes and it triggers anxiety in athletes is fucking mental. It, it, it holds them back. You know what I mean? More like, they're, they're so focused on progression. They're so fucking, as I said, paralysis by analysis, you know, everything is, is this way or the highway yeah. that it actually stops them from making progression. You know what I mean? Yeah. They can't have that time with their girlfriend or with their family and they can't enjoy the social side yeah. so they're so focused then they don't get the result that they want yeah. and it just uh, it has a, a net negative yeah. you know it's like mean, the, on everything what's that, what's that what's that term of phrase like, like your life is your home you know and the things that you love are the rooms and the house but if you constantly find yourself in one room and you never come out of that room and you open the door you're going to realise everyone's gone yeah, yeah. you know it's like I'm going to say everyone's gone I mean it's like the other aspects of your life will, will kind of cease to be there you know it's like and then the only place that you have peace is in that bodybuilding aspect, that bodybuilding room. Now, some people thrive in that environment. That's what they are and that's who they are and that's what they do. But I do think that the aspects of that that kind of produce a long-term impact need to be managed. Um, but at the same time, some people also need the opposite. They need to kick up the arse. They need to spend more time in that fucking room. You know, yeah. don't call yourself a bodybuilder when you're not living like that. Exactly. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. so it's like it's on both it's on both sides, and I also don't think that there's a middle ground. I think that there's a spectrum of where you should stay depending on where you're at in that goal. Like when you're on prep, stay in that fucking room. Yeah. You know, take take a take a little look out every now and again. You know, but like when it's time to be in that room and it's time to go to work, it's time to go to work. You know, but when you have the wiggle room to live your life and enjoy it, and there's no negative impact on you doing so, you should. When peaking an athlete, what are the main considerations? Using keen as an example. Um, yeah, well, it's the same with every athlete, in my opinion. Just making sure you're fucking lean enough, first yeah, of all. Well, for, yeah, so like in terms of like priorities, I suppose, number one is being in condition. You have to be in condition. You can't peak fat, unfortunately. And it would be great if you could, but you can't. So you can't peak fat, and everyone's heard that before. So if you're fat, you know, you can't really improve upon being fat. You can do what you can to make that look better than it could be, um, but you can't peak somebody who's still fat. It's just not going to happen, but you can't peak fat off a of frame. Second thing is going to be hydration. Are, are you hydrated enough? What is your water? What is your sodium? What is your potassium? Where are the mineral contents and the fluid contents that you take in day to day? Where are they? Because they are going to be part of, if not the most pinnacle part of the peak of being successful, um, is understanding someone's hydration levels and understanding where their water is at. So try and figure out that information long prior um, in terms of how much water somebody takes in a day, how much salt they take in a day, and therefore you can work out somebody's sodium or potassium from there. Because that's going to be the key player on maintaining a certain um, level of fullness when you may add or remove things that are going to work against that or work even for that. Then it's going to be obviously food. Um, it's like how much food does this person need? What data do you have on that individual in terms of the food they can tolerate? What is the result off the back of that food? And how are you going to use that data with training, with food, with cardio, um, with hydration to manipulate itself to produce the best look? Fatigue, then is going to be arguably the biggest one. Fatigue and stress are kind of accompany into both. Yeah. They're both the same. You know, a stress and tired physique is a physique that's not going to look at 100%. Being confident in your ability to pull back as early as necessary and not understand and understanding that that doesn't necessarily mean that somebody's going to get fat. You know, when people make adjustments and move into a peak, you need to understand just how deep in the depths of the hole that person is. Most of the time, you know, on a day-to-day -day diet, you might be two, three hundred calories in a deficit. And again, there's no way of actually quantifying that, but that's roughly maybe five hundred at max. If you're doing like some kind of rapid fat loss, you might be upwards of that. Our setting for prep, adding lipolytics in, adding cardio in, adding steps in, training demand in, 
Like you're easily in upwards of a thousand calories of a deficit a day. Yeah. Easily. Yeah. You know, it's not more. And like understanding that pulling cardio out of that isn't gonna fucking push that push them into a fucking circus. They're throwing a hundred gram a car a day, you know, it's like it, 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 come on, you know, and then understanding that the value of adjustments is all about mitigating fatigue and then trusting the food you fucking eat. Because this is the biggest issue that people have is they don't trust the food. And what I mean by that is if you trust the food, it'll trust you back. You won't deal with bloating. You won't deal with, you know, difficulties digesting food. Obviously, if you eat bad food, you eat gone off food, you're going to have a fucking hard time. But, like, if you can understand that there will be a very sudden turn of the dial to where you're eating a lot more than you have been, and you accept that as a benefit and not a negative, and you allow a drop in cardio to be recepted well, and you allow those changes, which are so contrary to what you've done up until that point. A peak is the total fucking opposite of what you have done for 20 25, 19, 18 weeks. It's the total opposite. And when you turn that dial, accepting that and understanding what it is and why it is will immediately be a very, very positive thing in terms of leading to your peak. I have a, are you finished? Yeah. I have a little sub question for you. What would you do with a client who is coming to peak week and is still chasing fat loss? It depends on how close to chasing fat loss they are. Like if this is somebody's first show of the season and they're just not in condition enough, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna work them into the show, really. Like depending on the extent of condition that they need, like if they're still fairly fat, you know, they've probably pulled it, you know, but if they need to qualify, just like here, just walk into the show and walk off. You know, do that. Um, you'll see that a lot of the time. You'll see somebody yeah, else yeah, will do that yeah. start of the year, they'll walk in, walk off, come on, take it off season, come back at the end yeah. of the year. Then in terms of what I would probably do, like if somebody was close enough, like you just the, the process of peaking them would just be smaller. Mm-hmm. So like where somebody's already conditioned, ready to rock and would, roll. Would you would say would you continue to, to drive cardio all the way up? Not all the way up. Not all but, the way up. You know, maybe if they're competing on the Saturday, I might pull cardio on the Wednesday or Thursday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give them a little feed on the Friday night. You know, something very small. Maybe you're already doing like a feed of them anyway. Whatever their feed is normally, do that the night before jump on stage. You know, and do your best to do that because there's no point trying to overcomplicate somebody who's already carrying too much body fat. You know, and even when somebody's peeled, don't overcomplicate it. The yeah. least amount of things that you can change in a peak the better. You know, because you're making a, a choice to make them either. But of course, it is. ten ten percent better or ninety percent worse if it goes wrong. The more you change, the more you're the, the more you have to juggle. You know, a peak is spinning plates, and the more plates you have to spin, the more risk you have those plates falling. So if you're a fucking like diuretics, fucking cutting water, fucking low carb, fucking, you know, driving teeth through, whatever the fuck you're doing. You're spinning all these plates at the same time. As soon as something goes wrong, how do you know what plate fell? You have so many plates, how do you even pick up what plate fell? You don't know. You don't know. You have a clue. If you have one plate, if you have water, if you have sodium, if you have potassium, and they're just spinning over there doing their thing, and they're not changing fucking deadly, they're not going to fall. In fact, somebody's holding those plates. We're good, we got these plates. I think we'll leave it there. Man, that was plenty of questions. That was a... Podcast episode number one wrapped up. Yeah, supposedly. Q and A podcast. Um, so yeah, thanks very much, Ross, for coming on. Yeah, very Appreciate well, that. It's a pleasure. We won't be the last time. Um, you all probably know who Ross is, but Ross doesn't want any more clients. So if you want to be coached by someone <laughs> like myself, who's got it directly from the man, the myth. If you're some kind of genetic freak, come chat to me. <laughs> but nah. Um, no, nah, I, I do only work with relatively highly competitive athletes these days. But if there is anyone watching this who is looking for. You know somewhere to go to get started on that journey i couldn't recommend keen enough he's learned from me for the last two and a half three years so you know you're only going to be given information that i'd be confident in saying myself so a thousand percent if you're in that realm and you want somebody who has a level of experience a level of attentiveness and you know understands how this game works then you know he's sitting to my left here you'll be up um right thanks very much for watching please like subscribe comment all that youtuber shit, and we'll see you in the next one peace and love people get it fucking thumbnail.